Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Uh, in this session, I'll be giving a presentation about exploring the theoretical foundations and meaning of social capital. So I've been interested in social capital for at least 20 years. I, I first came across the concept uh, when I was doing my master's at the University of Queensland in Australia. And I wanted to understand how some land care groups seem to perform much better than other land care groups. So land care groups were a, a natural resource management group that helped look after the environment. And at the time, this is in the, the probably early 2000s, I felt the concept of social capital wasn't particularly well conceptualized. It was, I didn't feel like I could really use it in my research and get the kind of understanding that I wanted to, to reach uh, from the kinds of questions that I had. So in my master's, I switched to really just working on the theory and the conceptualization of social capital, and that became my master's. I then, after I finished, that became a website, socialcapitalresearch.com, and it's been a, a resource for people to, to be able to access for the last you know, 17 years or so, and I've added to it over time, and it's now about 250 different articles and is a big resource for people who want to, to get into and, and understand and explore what social capital capital is all about. And more recently, coming out of that, we've started holding webinars like this and getting people together and, and discussing it. And the latest step is, is to form an international association that can progress that, continue to bring people together and, and work on and understand the concept better. So in this session, I'm, I'm going to, my aim really is to explore uh, what the different approaches to social capital are and and hopefully we can we can get a better understanding of how these different approaches fit into into the theoretical foundations of social capital so before we we get into that which is i think the really interesting part of this um, i'll first explore what the theoretical foundations of social capital are and and why they're so often uncertain and confused uh, as well as that, we can have a look at why there are so many different theoretical and conceptual approaches to social capital. And this is something that I hear a lot from people is that there's, there's confusion about so many different approaches and different ways of, of thinking about the concept. Then we'll try and identify what those core ideas or core components of social capital are so that we can then build this typology and see how perhaps they all fit together. And I think that can be really quite useful to, to gain an understanding of it. So before I really get started, I wanted to clarify a few things. The first one is that what I'm trying to do here is create these conceptual boxes. And I want to sort of try and categorize different uh, research approaches or scholarly approaches into these boxes. But of course, reality doesn't fit neatly into these boxes and, and it will do with the best we can, but we often find that things don't quite fit perfectly. And really the, con the conceptual boxes just help us to try to understand things a bit better. The other thing is I try not to preference any single theory or explanation or methodology. So I like to try to appreciate the, the pros and cons and the strengths and weaknesses of every different approach. And I also like to um, try to understand how different perspectives, like what sort of information and knowledge are generated from different kinds of approaches uh, to social capital. Another thing that is important, I think, to understand that the scholarly work should be understood within the context of the school of thought within which it was created, and of course, the era as well. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about some of the early theorists of social capital who worked on this, you know, 40 years ago. And I think it's important to understand the, the, the context within which they were doing that work. And also want to try and avoid the really deep philosophical or, or theoretical discussions, because the audience for this presentation really is anybody who's interested in social capital, anybody who's interested in doing research, particularly it's got a bit of a research focus, but I don't want to talk only to sociologists or only to economists. So I want to keep it broad enough that everybody can engage and understand with the sorts of things that we're saying. So this is, this is my intention and hopefully, hopefully I can stick to it. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about the promise of social capital and some, something positive before I really delve into the confusion and the, the uncertainty that exists in, in a lot of the, the theoretical approaches to social capital. So if we have a look at the literature on this, and I've, I've given entire webinars on the promise of social capital, but I just wanted to bring up a few points first. So first one is to reprioritize and revitalize how we think about the multiple facets of human economic activity, to provide a more holistic frame for the study of social action, to highlight the significance of relational social factors beyond under socialized views, to facilitate interdisciplinary dialogue, to provide a common frame of reference for discussions around disciplinary, methodological, ideological, and cultural boundaries, and provide opportunities for trans and interdisciplinary research and break down discipline barriers that limit new ways of understanding social phenomena. So certainly social capital offers an enormous amount, and I guess this is the reason why it's one of the most popular and, and commonly used concepts across all of the social sciences. Um, it's right up there with the concept like globalization as being just about one of the most uh, commonly uh, used or studied concepts. So it it's, has a lot of promise, but unfortunately there are a lot of um, uncertainty in the, the theoretical foundations. And we're now three or perhaps even four decades of, of, of scholarly work on trying to clarify what social capital is and what it means. But there's a lot of critical literature that suggests that there's a lot of confusion and contradiction in the literature still, and that it's it's generally undefined, you know, uncertain, it's often confused. Uh, Michael Woolcock back in 1998 talked about if social capital can be rational, pre-rational and even non-rational, then what is it not? And all of these different ways in which social capital might be understood. And Ben Fine uh, has also been very vocal about this and suggesting that the dominant conceptual approaches to social capital tend to incorporate its determinants and consequences of part of itself with boundaries between its parts becoming blurred. And so this is talking to that difficulty that we tend to find of, of separating the source of social capital from the form, you know, what social capital really is from the outcomes that it produces. And so another quote here, I just wanted to focus on one part of it. The, the whole thing, no doubt, is, is true. Um, but it, this suggests that social capital is made up of components that do not hang together in a coherent and productive way. And this is what we see, I think, from quite a bit of the criticism is that social capital, you know, norms and networks, how, how do these fit together? How do these components actually work? What is the theory that actually underpins um, most of these approaches to social capital? So what was social, why was social capital coined? You know, what was it attempting to, to modify or extend? What was the purpose of social capital? And if we go back to, to some of those uh, original early ideas, what we tend to see, and this is James Coleman, one of the, the key early scholars on social capital, talked about how it was a response to the perceived efficiencies of mainstream neoclassical economic theorizing. And there's other ideas in the literature as well along similar kinds of lines, suggesting that it's corrective to Thatcher's idea there's no such thing as society. And also this idea that perhaps with the use of social capital, it may be possible to kill off some of the more naive applications of neoclassical theory. And if we go back even before uh, James Coleman, we find that Glenn Lowry used the term in his 1977 dissertation to criticize the narrowly individualistic and atomistic understanding of human capital in neoclassical economic theorizing. So we see quite consistently that there's this need to correct for asocial ways of thinking about the world. So that the core kind of adage or the core understanding of social capital being that relationships matter and this need to reintroduce the social and move past this idea of humans as just purely being self-interested utility maximizers, that there's, there's more to human action and experience than, than just that. And I think if I reflect on the reasons why I came to using social capital 20 years ago and was interested in it, 
it was because I felt like the land care groups, the success of the land care groups wasn't just being explained by the number of volunteers or the amount of government funding that was provided to them. There was something else, something social that was going on that was being overlooked. And that's what I wanted to investigate. And the hundreds of people that I talked to uh, about social capital, that's one of the consistent things that I think we tend to find is that they're interested in, in looking at the more social aspects that are often overlooked. So James Coleman was, was quite keen to integrate economics and, and sociology, and he wanted to try and include aspects of, of both of these uh, intellectual streams in the concept of social capital. But I think a really important question is, how can we actually reconcile the ontological foundations of, of economics and sociology? And the key question, I think, is, is what is the, con the theoretical concept of human experience and action that exists in this social capital research? So within economics, and, and particularly within neoclassical economics, we have this concept of homo economicus, you know, that, that humans are agents who are consistently rational and narrowly self-interested and, and who pursue utility maximization. That's what drives human experience and action. And it's been suggested that that's under socialized, that it doesn't take sufficiently take account of the social nature of human experience and action. So the other side of this integration that James Coleman wanted to achieve, we could say is homo sociologicus. So this is a more the idea that humans act not only to pursue self-interest, but actions are governed by social norms and rules and obligation. An action is shaped and constrained and redirected by social context. But some people have suggested that this is over-socialized and over-emphasizing the importance of, of these kinds of social um, the definitions of human experience. So as, a, as an integration of these two schools of thought, uh, perhaps social capital is about homo socio-capitalists. So this is Ben Fine's term uh, for what perhaps sits in the middle. But the difficulty arises because we're not really quite sure what that con concept of, or theoretical foundation, the concept of human experience is. And Ben Fine suggested that whilst the social capitalist is nowhere near as reduced as homo economicus, it's striking how shallow and incoherent, uh, incoherent socio, homo socio-capitalist is. And so this is kind of one of those key questions is that uh, within economics, we have a very solid and robust understanding of human experience. Within social theory, we also have very robust, not just one, but many different understandings of, of human experience and action. But as an integration of these, I think quite often we end up with a bit of uncertainty about what we're actually talking about and what we mean. But this can't be, it kind of started this way. Surely there are some, some theoretical foundations. And, and there are, if we have a look at some of the early theorists on social capital, we see that Pierre Bourdieu, starting really in the late 70s, early 1980s, developed quite a strong theoretical foundation for social capital around his concepts of, of habitus and fields. So there's a rich sociology there that explains his, his theoretical foundation for, for social capital and, and the other forms of capital as well that he worked on. Similarly, James Coleman was very explicit about the theoretical foundations of his approach. He was using rational choice theory. He wanted to modify neoclassical economic theory to make it more social. So he had a very strong theoretical foundation and that work was started probably in the, in the mid, early to mid uh, 1980s and was published in, in 1988 and in 1990 particularly, uh, some of those key works. And I'll also say the major source of theoretical foundations came from Nan Lin uh, and also Ronald Bird as well. They, they have quite different approaches, but in the sort of mid to late 1990s, uh, they brought in social resource theory and, and network theories into social capital that had a very rich, you know, a, a 20 or 30 or 40 year uh, history of theoretical foundation into social capital. And I think so. I think no one could accuse any of these scholars of being confused uh, about the theoretical foundations of the work that they did. 
But I think over time, what we've seen is it's gone from explicit statements of the, these theoretical foundations by the scholars I just mentioned and, and others as well. And then followers have perhaps been more implicit about those theoretical foundations and then followers perhaps have been a little bit more uncertain and we kind of have this slide down the ladder to some extent. So those early scholars were acutely aware of theory and they were very deliberately attempting to modify or scaffold from that existing theory. But I think a lot of the time following scholars, particularly from other disciplines outside of economics and sociology, were less concerned with the theory and, and preferred the empirical inquiry much more. And I think a really good example of somebody who was very focused on empiricism was Robert Putnam. So some scholars wittingly or unwittingly divorce social capital from those theoretical foundations, often leaving it implicitly grounded, which you wouldn't say is a problem, but, but sometimes it was becoming more and more divorced. And eventually uh, many followers confused and misunderstood these different theoretical foundations and started mixing and matching across these different approaches. You know, it's the theoretical foundations of, of Bourdieu really are very, very different than rational choice theory of, of James Coleman. Um, and so simply taking little bits of, of approaches and, and developing a methodology without thinking about those theoretical foundations can be a little bit of a challenge. For, for many authors, though, I think the lack of theoretical foundations actually made it more palatable to a wider audience. And, and part of what we're thinking about here is people outside of economics and sociology that were being attracted to this concept of social capital. And that includes me. 20 years ago, I was a geographer and environmental scientist. I wanted to understand in the context of natural resource management, I didn't really know about any of this underlying theoretical foundations. I didn't know the difference between Bourdieu and rational choice theory of, of James Coleman. Um, so for me, I was, I was quite confused, uh, as probably a lot of people are for, for quite a long time. And Ben Fine has suggested that this really is, is what led to hack academia or, or hackademia, as he terms it. But I think that this picture um, it seems very, very negative, but it's nowhere near as bad as this would suggest. Because I think a lot of people, a lot of scholars, they simply import in whatever theoretical foundations they're working from. So psychologists approaching social capital, for example, don't just abandon their entire theoretical foundations of their discipline to work with social capital. They bring that with them and they understand the social capital theories and approaches from their existing um, theoretical foundations, from their discipline specific um, approaches and understandings. So I think most people really approaching social capital are working more up in this area, probably more so in the implicit area. Um, but certainly there are some, as there are, I guess, in, in all research areas that are, are quite confused and ultimately quite confounded in some cases. So I think another really important approach, and I've, I've actually provided all of the words here so we can follow through it. So I think it was hoped that an evidence-based approach would overcome the conceptual and theoretical weaknesses of social capital. But unfortunately, I think the the concepts weak theoretical foundations frequently undermine the validity of empirical inquiry that was being done. The concept was often used with familiar methodologies without a strong theoretical framework to inform the validity and rigor of the approach. And I think for a lot of, a lot of scholarly work, this, this led to struggles for legitimacy. And certainly the critical literature on social capital has grown in, in parallel with the concepts rapidly increasing popularity, uh, with the critique, critiques are widely accepted, but they're unfortunately, um, they're rarely challenged because I think most people accept that they're, most of them are quite true. So we identified that there's, a, there's several different uh, theoretical foundations from Bourdieu, from Coleman, from Lynn, and there's others as well. But I think we need to acknowledge that the dominant, the origins of the dominant approach really came from James Coleman through Putnam and the World Bank. And it's worth touching on, on this and understanding what they were trying to achieve. So back in the late 1970s, Gary Becker 
was was working on a project that eventually won won him a Nobel Prize. So that was to apply the economic approach to all social activity. And in 1976, Becker claimed that, and I quote, the economic approach is a comprehensive one that is applicable to all human behavior. An approach that has been described by some as economics imperialism, since it invades and displaces alternative theories in the social sciences uh, beyond economics. So in the 1980s, human capital was already really well established and Gary Becker was a front runner in, in, that, in those theories of human capital. And he turned his attention to social capital, working with James Coleman at the University of Chicago. So Coleman was a sociologist, but one that Roger Bolton has described as much appreciated by economists, given his use of rational choice theory that is, is consistent with methodological individualism and, and neoclassical economic theorizing. But Coleman was quite keen to, to work on on that and to change it and to make it more social. Um, what we saw though really uh, over time is that Gary Becker's influence has been largely forgotten. Uh, his explicit uh, imperialism was, was seen as not being particularly palatable, whereas the rational choice sociology, if you like, of James Coleman was seen as more desirable. And I think most people don't actually realize that Gary Becker was a, a really important forerunner in the in social capital theory development in the early 1980s. So from Coleman, uh, Putnam, uh, Putnam ad ad adopted James Coleman's approach, um, but somewhat changed it a little bit. He didn't talk particularly about rational choice theory or in, in fact about foundational theories all that much at all. Um, but Putnam's approach is still very heavily grounded in methodological individualism. Uh, Law and Mooney in a 2006 article described how Putnam unashamedly borrows from neoclassical economics, game theory, and rational choice theories of collective action. So we certainly don't see these theoretical foundations anywhere near as explicitly uh, in Putnam's work, but they certainly still provide the, the general foundation for, for his approach. And of course, the World Bank's approach is also based on this kind of lineage of, of thinking. Uh, and we see that now really being the dominant approach to, to social capital uh, that is really underpinned by um, rational choice theory and, and that understanding of, of human experience and action. So social capital corrects for this a, for a social, but without much deviation from neoclassical axioms. And I think that's really quite understandable considering the, the episteme, the paradigm of the time, you know, the need in the 1980s and 1990s to be seen to be scientific, to be objective, to be tangible. Uh, and this was the way in which to get published and probably the way in which to to actually affect change, you know, without being able to move the needle a little bit to, to challenge the existing thoughts at the time, um, we may not have had the social capital, the interest in social capital that we have now, which is, is, is fantastic. And we saw from the promise that it could achieve an awful lot. But I think overall, what we see is that social capital underperforms, you know, it, it generates some new knowledge, it can be really good in some ways, but in some cases, it may actually reinforce the very problem we're trying to overcome, which is to place more emphasis on the importance of social processes. So what can be done? What can we do to, to fix this? And I think to date, most attempts uh, to build these, these theoretical foundations have defaulted to methodological individualism, because that's what is deemed to be scientific. That's what people know. That's what's often considered to be good science and, and rigorous work um, is to default to this, these kinds of positions. But it's been suggested, particularly by Ben Fine, that we can't start with neoclassical axioms as the starting point. So um, Milikonis and Fine suggested that conceptions of social capital that start from methodological individualism and attempt to add back in the social are unacceptable. And they go on to say that if social is given legitimate treatment and meaningfully included in analysis, then the isolated individual of the economist's imagination ceases to have any legitimacy. Uh, 
So this is a pretty strong argument for moving beyond um, just the methodological individualism. So the solution really is quite obvious to have a balanced theoretical or philosophical approach to human experience and action. And I think that's really important for it to be really effective, for it to be really transformative. That's the kind of thing that we, we need to be able to implement. The key question here, of course, is will it actually be accepted in the current episteme or the current paradigm, the way we think about things at the time? So this to me then is the real potential. You know, we have what has been described as under-socialized and over-socialized views. So we have the potential for this homo socio-capitalist to perhaps be the Goldilocks, you know, be the, the perfect fit that isn't constrained to any kind of disciplinary thinking. We can, it can be multi or interdisciplinary. It can focus on rationality and calculation and self-interest, but also the socially situated, subjectively defined nature of, of human experience. It can also take into account cognitive processes and instinct, as well as morality and emotion and feeling and all of these kinds of ideas that don't necessarily just come from one discipline. You know, we can, we, this is, I think, the potential, the opportunity that social capital presents. So we've just gone pretty deep into in quite a lot of theory and, and mostly looking at how most of the dominant approaches are based on methodological individualism, although implicitly and perhaps lost or confused or glossed over, or maybe we're not really sure what it is at all. Um, now I want to go in a slightly different direction and look at what the different approaches are and, and why there's so many different approaches and understandings to social capital. So to answer this question, we can look at the different epistemological and ontological foundations that come from people approaching social capital from different disciplines, different schools of thought, different interest areas. So these different levels of interest, different contexts, there's so many differences in the way in which people might actually approach social capital, including different methodological requirements and the need for measurement that may drive people towards certain understandings of social capital that, that can be measured. So certainly there is considerable diversity and, and complexity in definitions and approaches, but just how much definition is there really? So a couple of years ago, I did a survey of, of 250 peer-reviewed journal articles that were published between January 2019 and June 2020, and I looked for who was being cited for the definition of social capital. I also looked at different conceptual approaches, methodological approaches, and other things as well, um, but just talking about the the definitions, we see that, that Putnam, Bourdieu, Coleman, you know, these contemporary authors were certainly cited quite frequently. But one of the key things we see is that 76 other authors were cited fewer than five times. So we see an enormous amount of variation in the definition or the understanding of social capital that exists in the literature. And this is quite recent. This is only a couple of years ago. We also see social capital quite frequently not actually being defined. So this is 25 of the 250 articles. I found a total of 356 definitions. So about 10% of the articles didn't actually clearly define social capital and nearly as many either used their own definition or didn't cite anybody for the definition that they used of social capital. So we certainly see an enormous amount of variety in the understandings of what social capital actually means. So if we examine some of these uh, definitions in a little bit more detail and, and pull out the key components, we see Putnam talked about social organization and gave a few examples of, of networks, norms, and social trust, and also specified what social capital does in that it facilitates coordination and cooperation. Now, Coleman talked about a variety of different entities, and this is something that we see quite consistent, consistently, as it's not one thing, it's actually several different things. And it really about social structures, and it facilitates the actions of actors. So again, it talks about what social capital actually does. These two definitions are, are quite similar, um, Bourdieu and Napier and Goschel's definitions, you'll see enormous similarity. They both talk about resources that are linked to or that they're embedded in relationships, so social networks, and social networks is something that we see quite consistently. 
Nan Lin talked about resources as well, being in social networks. And Portez talked about securing benefits because of social networks. Uh, Francis Fukuyama had a slightly different approach, talking about an informal norm, uh, but again talked about cooperation as being an outcome. And the World Bank, very similar to Putnam's uh, definition, institutions, relationships, norms, again, talking about the outcome that shaped the quality and quantity of society, social interactions. That's quite similar to talking about cooperation. OECD is quite similar. Networks, norms, values, understandings that facilitate cooperation. And Bowles and Gintis was a little bit different. We've got trust and concern for associates and, and norms and to punish others. So that's really about sanctions. So what I did across all of the 356 definitions that I analyzed was I looked for key themes that I, I tended to find over and over and over again in these definitions. So we see things like social network structure, uh, social structures, trust, uh, shared norms, resources, benefits, cooperation, these kinds of things. So I tried to identify what are these things really talking about? So networks and social structures about connectedness, uh, trust and trustworthiness norms. This might be sociability, you know, the way in which people uh, relate to each other. Resources are just resources, and that's a consistent theme that we see. And there's often reference to the outcomes of, of social capital as well, the cooperation, the benefits that might occur as a result of it. So if we then look at how this breaks down into the different approaches, if we have the connectedness, the sociability, the resources, then a focus exclusively on connectedness is often talked about as being the network approach, which focuses on the networks and structures. The resource approach often focus on, focuses on the resources and the connectedness, so the networks. And the normative, which is also sometimes called the humanitarian approach, focuses on that sociability and, and connectedness as well. So norms and trust as, as well as networks. And this is the dominant approach that we see coming from Coleman and Putnam and the World Bank. Um, this is, is probably the most popular and commonly used approach. But I also want to acknowledge that there's, a, there's hugely varied and vastly different approaches that don't fit into those categories identified. And when I did that survey of the literature, I tried to actually allocate each journal article into one of those three uh, approaches. And I found I, I couldn't do it. I found that they would kind of fit in one sort of, but it wasn't clear. And it ended up feeling like a very subjective assessment that in the end, I, I decided it wasn't particularly valid to try to do that. All of these other, what I'm calling heterodox approaches to social capital, they tend to be elusive and, and difficult to identify, but I, th I think they exist in approaches like Adler and Kwong, where they talked about goodwill available to individuals and groups, or Robertson talking about sympathy, or Costover and Roth talking about psychological states, perceptions, behavioral expectations. These, these ideas don't fit particularly well into those other approaches that I've already talked about. And there's a huge amount of variety and variation that exists. So if we assume that social capital is a theory, you know, what is a theory and how can we actually shape and understand all of these different components within the context of the theory? So Abend talked about how uh, a theory is a general proposition or a logically connected system of general propositions which establishes a relationship between two or more variables. So what are the propositions associated with the theories of social capital? And I've, I've put theories in inverted quotation marks here because some people have suggested that there is no theory behind social capital, that there is, it doesn't explain anything. Um, but I think it does, and I think we can identify what that theory, or some of those, some components of that theory might actually be. So social capital is, is something social, we'll leave it quite uh, broad and vague for now, that is capital in some kind of way. And similarly, capital might be uh, meant uh, literally or more metaphorically. But certainly I think social uh, capital has a, a potential, uh, an ability, a capacity to be able to produce certain kinds of outcomes. I think that's a, a common characteristic of capital. I think it's what we're largely talking about when we're talking about social capital. You know, a lot of the definition saying has, can facilitate cooperation, can secure benefits for members of groups. So it has this, this ability to do something. 
So what we're really saying is then that there's a causal relationship between this something social and, and some certain outcomes. And we might be able to, to annotate it like this, that social capital as X has a causal relationship with Y as in the outcome in a particular context. But we're still left with quite a lot of questions. You know, what is this X? What is this form of social capital? Where does it come from? What is the source? And, and what does X actually do? What are the outcomes of social capital? And there's certainly some quite different perspectives in the literature about this and whether or not social capital is the resources flowing through networks or the network structure itself. So if we use this analogy of electricity wires, then some authors may record, re regard social capital as the wires or the, the social infrastructure, the social networks, whereas others regard it as the electricity or the social resources that can flow over those wires, or others may consider it the conductivity of the environment, you know, the norms, the trust, the belonging that enable or facilitate the flows of benefits. And some authors may regard it as one or more of these different components, um, talking about this analogy of electricity wires. So this originally came from Stretzer and Woolcott, a 2004 publication where they proposed wires and electricity. And I've extended that to include the, the conductivity of the enabling environment as well. So let's dig into this, this typology. Let's try and organize this source and, and form and outcome. So we're saying that this social capital, the form of social capital, what social capital really is, is some sort of a potential or ability or capacity to achieve certain kinds of outcomes. So if we lay, overlay our annotation here, we can't forget about context, of course, which is terribly important in the realization of those outcomes. Now, these outcomes may be benefits. So they may be things like cooperation and giving and sharing or information flows, collective action. These are the kinds of things that, that are maybe outcomes. But also downsides, as we know, can also arise from the same kinds of social structures, social setting as well. There's dynamic interrelationships between the outcomes and the source. When we uh, cooperate, we're quite literally uh, reshaping and dynamically changing that form of social capital again. So outcomes can become sources, and this is a significant source of complication for, for doing research on social capital. So the sources may be things like personality and religion, or they might be social heterogeneity or, or urban design, might be history and culture. This is just simply a list from David Halpern's 2005 book. And it just gives us a starting point for understanding perhaps some of the things that might be the sources of social capital. And I can just drop in here all of the things, all of the themes we've already identified. Uh, the networks, the norms, the trust, the belonging, and so forth in here. Um, but I've placed resources under context. Now, it really depends on whether or not you think how you define resources. Um, but resources, say from Nan's Lynn's perspective, resources are really defined as being uh, personal resources that are mobilized across social network, become social resources. So I'm not sure we can really go around and we can add up the bank account of each individual person and add the car and the house and the, you know, all of these personal resources of each individual and call it social capital. These things are certainly mobilized. I think they're part of the context. They're an important part, but perhaps they fit here uh, rather than being in the form of social capital. But of course, there's different perspectives about this. Um, and there's certainly, um, it's a complicated issue, I think. So why is there a causal, causal relationship? So the, the, the really the core uh, understanding of social capital, if, if you like, is, is that networks or relationships are important, that they produce cooperation and, and these kinds of outcomes. But I think the reason why we want to understand more than networks, all of these other things are here as well, um, is because more is involved. And if we understand the electricity grid analogy from before, we might say that the wires are this, this network and social structures, 
the electricity is the resources that may be mobilized over that those wires and the conductivity of those wires is is the trust and the norms and the belonging that may allow that uh, those those benefits to flow so if we look at this as a logic schema and Suk Wu Kwong and Paul Adler in 2014 talked about a logic schema in that individuals must have the opportunity for social exchange, they must be motivated towards such exchange, and they must have some capability or resource for exchange. So I think this is quite true from a, an exchange point of view, but perhaps there are some other outcomes that are not quite so reliant on, on the existence of resources. But this perhaps is a, is a useful way to think about the different components or the, the main different aspects of, of social capital. We can also place the different conceptual approaches over the top of this uh, typology as well. Um, the network approach, it really is, is here. It's exclusively really focused on the, on the structure of networks. But we need to acknowledge it's not a single approach, but a variety of different and but similar approaches. And things that might in, be involved are things like mapping ties, identifying configurations, analyzing directionality and reciprocity, and all of these social structural qualities such as density and multiplexity and segregation, holes, closure, boundaries, bridges, and so forth. There's a lot of different things that may be analyzed from this perspective. But I think we can see that it sits and exists here, and this is what it focuses on most. So this, is, this can be a really useful way of generating new knowledge about how people are connected in a particular context. And, it, and it's got a long history of, of producing interesting research results. I think it dates all the way back to the 1950s. And it was only really in the 1990s that it was kind of relabeled, if you like, as, as being social capital. Uh, the resource approach would sit here because it's resources mobilized by networks. And the resource approach really is a rebranding of social resource theory, which was worked on extensively from probably about the 1970s. And one of the, the big champions was Nan Lin. So Nan Lin defined these social resources as the wealth, the power, the reputation, as well as the social networks. And it may include material goods such as land and houses and car and money and symbolic goods such as education and membership in clubs and all of these kinds of things, family name, reputation, all of this. And so from this approach, social capital contains three elements intersecting structure and action. So the embeddedness, the accessibility, and the use aspects are talked about. So it sits here, and this is one of the few approaches that I think is, is actually capable of understanding social stratification and inequality, because it doesn't simply say that um, you know, networks and norms is all that's required for there to be really positive outcomes. It says if there's no resources to share, then these outcomes can't occur. You know, if, you're, if you live in a village and nobody has a tractor, you can't borrow it. It can't be loaned or given or shared. There can't be that help provided if that resource doesn't exist. So I, I think there's a, a lot of really positive research, again, can be done coming out of this, this resource approach. And the thought, third approach sits here. So it sits very neatly in the form. It looks like it's quite comprehensive. Um, but as we've discussed previously, there often isn't a particularly good theoretical foundation of what actually motivates human action and experience that might produce the kinds of outcomes we're interested in. So this is, this is very broad. Um, and I won't talk in a great more detail about this. Um, but I want to move on and have a look at, at how we might think about sources based on the different approaches. So the network approach, the sources may be those things that facilitate or maintain those networks. The resource approach may be factors that create and maintain these social resources and facilitate their mobilization. And from the normative perspective, it might be factors that shape the nature of social norms and sanctions and trust and solidarity. And I've put et cetera here because it could be a wide variety of other things as well. This is just a list of some of those things. 
We can understand the dimensions of social capital. Uh, again, within this typology, that the, the structural dimension is really about the networks and social structures. So, you know, this is about the impersonal configuration of linkages between people and, and units. Uh, the relational dimension of social capital it might be here. This is the, the characteristics and qualities of personal relationships, such as trust and obligations and respect and so forth. And the cognitive dimension might be down here. This is the, the, the resources providing shared representations, interpretations and systems of meaning between parties. That's really essential for us to be able to to cooperate and collaborate, to have these, these sort of foundational understandings. We can also place bonding and, and bridging on this schema, but perhaps not quite so, so well. Um, and I think this perhaps needs a bit of work to, to fit this in a little bit better. Um, it's clearly about the, the nature of the network, the, but really we, we, it comes from social heterogeneity. There's a lot of approaches, of course, to bonding and bridging, but the, the similarity of people and the structure of the network, and we might then uh, reach some conclusions about the, the nature of social trust and norms and, and belonging and solidarity that might exist as a result of that kind of structure, and therefore the access to resources and the, the cooperation that might come from as well. So again, I think this typology doesn't perhaps fit particularly well for, for the bonding and bridging approach and might require a little bit more consideration. <clears throat> we can also use this typology to, to place individual approaches. So, so Putnam focused on networks, uh, norms, and social trust, and he also then identified cooperation as the outcome. Uh, of social capital. And then Lin's approach we know is, is the resource approach, so resources and networks, uh, doesn't make specific reference to outcomes, but of course um, the outcomes are the mobilization of these resources. And so perhaps uh, none of these downsides are actually relevant if we're looking at the, the, the resource approach to social capital. Fukuyama focused on norms, uh, again, defined that as, co as cooperation as being the outcome. And we can do this for, for any approach. I think it's kind of a useful exercise to think about different ways in which people are, are conceptualizing social capital. So this is the, the six dimensions from the World Bank. We see things like networks and social structures, you know, trust and solidarity. Then we see cooperation and, and uh, collaboration. Uh, collective action. We see information flows and communication isn't actually on here, but it's um, it's one of those things that perhaps is a source of social capital. Social cohesion of, of circled belonging is perhaps similar. And I've added empowerment down there as well. And as I mentioned, all of these items really are just lists. These are just possible examples. And there might be a whole lot more such as empowerment that are really, really relevant. And we see here that, to be honest, it's a little bit of a mess. We see things that I would consider to be an outcome of social capital mixed in with a variety of things that are that you know, potential ability, that the form of social capital. And it's, it seems a bit confused uh, to me. We can also look at different contexts. Um, so a really famous one that James Coleman talked about was wholesale diamond merchants in New York who would lend bags of diamonds for examination before sale without any formal contracts or insurance. So the outcome here, I think the key outcome here is the reduced transaction costs. And we could identify the types of form of social capital that may lead to that outcome. And it's really everything that's listed here, the networks, the trust. And then we could dig into the processes that are involved and how that's actually shaping the kinds of outcomes that we're interested in. And we may then also find that these same kinds of networks and trust and norms also result in social exclusion and isolation in certain circumstances as well. So again, this typology can be used to understand these different types of contexts. Uh, running a little short on time, so I'm going to skip over this one. The point I wanted to make here was simply that, that each of these individual components can be understood to be quite different. Um, depending on the school of thought that you come from. Um, so I'll really quickly go through this slide. It simply illustrates how something that we might understand as social norms to be one, have one meaning from different perspectives can actually have quite different meanings. Uh, and so this typology, kind of, it kind of 
um, hopefully it helps us to understand these different perspectives, but really there's more to it. We need to dig into what these individual components actually mean from, from different theoretical foundations. I think this can also be really useful for thinking about measurement outcomes, because potentially anything that we've listed here could be used as a proxy for measuring social capital. So in the past, it's been quite uh, common or popular to have to look at the incidence of social support, for example, which I've defined as an outcome of social capital as a proxy for the existence of social capital itself. Uh, similarly, we could have a look at some of these things like social heterogeneity, perhaps uh, history and culture, perhaps class or education uh, as an indicator that maybe social capital exists in a particular format. So I think this typology could help us to focus our attention on what, what is the source and the form and the outcome and how our different measurement approaches might be gathering information, different types of information about social capital that we're interested in. I know there's, I've covered an enormous amount. Uh, I think there's still things missing from here. The, the key one that stands out to me is power. And I think to really incorporate power into this, we need to give it proper treatment here within the form of social capital, you know, by understanding how networks provide differential access uh, to resources or to, um, to different benefits as a result of people in different positions of power. And similarly, how you know, trust and norms and belonging can also work to reinforce those same kinds of things. So, power isn't listed on this typology at all, but I think we can see how it can, can play a role. Uh, similarly, communication or communicative processes aren't listed here. Um, it's probably a really important source of social capital that, that isn't listed in, in David Halpern's list. Um, so we could dig into that a lot more and refine what these sources actually are. Uh, similarly, things like individual competencies, um, and also goodwill and sympathy and empowerment, social identity, uh, morality, perhaps a lot of these things could exist in this area as well, keeping in mind, of course, that these things really are just a list. They're not comprehensive. There are more related things that should exist in that area. Uh, we might ask where human capital fits into this equation, and I think it, it fits into individual competencies, you know, the, the communication skills, the empathy, the ability to listen, you know, all of these sorts of scope, social skills, I think we could call human capital, uh, which are clearly in a very important source of the form of social capital. But of course, the, the information, the knowledge, the skills, these kinds of personal resources also can be mobilized and can therefore um, be part of that context that affects the realization of it as well. Um, from a, a universality point of view, I think it's really important to identify that none of these things are universal. I think we can, if we can do this, then we can understand power a little bit at least, um, because treating norms as a single entity universalizes across class and gender and ethnicity and all of the other cleavages of society and is really incapable of understanding power and inequality and discrimination. So we need to include this in the way we think about um, social capital from, of course, different contexts, different perspectives require a different approach. And that's one of the things that complicates social capital so much. All right. I uh, want to touch on a bit more about what the perhaps the core themes that may exist under social capital. Um, this is getting a little bit into perhaps my own um, my own worldview, my own discipline specific understandings. So as you'll note, none of these things really are core themes. They're all just lists. Uh, and we could add more or less things to this list, depending on the things that we come up with. So perhaps there's some core ideas that actually represent these things. We can move past lists to something that is a core idea. So outcomes, most of the scholars talked about the outcomes being social action. Um, you know, Coleman talked about the actions of actors. Uh, Nan Lin talked about social action. Um, I think most of these are actions when it comes down to it or the result of actions. But that's not quite perfect because some of them, like mental health, perhaps aren't necessarily the result of direct action. So there's a, a little bit of a challenge there in understanding what the core idea is. 
So why do people act in a certain way? Well, this is kind of the result of, of human experience, isn't it? That we, we believe certain things, we think certain things, feel certain things, certain cognitive processes, the norms, the, the calculation, all of these things then shape the nature of our action. So then the source would be anything that influences that action. But I think this is just far too broad. You know, it's basically a theory of everything and it doesn't have particularly a whole lot of value. So we may be able to narrow it down a little bit more than that. So action, sure. Um, but we can perhaps start looking at uh, social structure, you know, structure and agency, this, this common duality that we find in, in understanding of society. And there certainly are these two roles that shape the nature of our action. Um, so it might be something like uh, Habermas's theory of system and life world, perhaps, that is quite relevant here. But I think well, there's, there's two main components. And this is also quite well reflected in, in the dimensions approach to social capital, where it's the structural dimension and the, the cognitive dimension, really representing structure and, and agency. But that doesn't fit particularly well, so I've used predispositions here. Context, of course, being really important. And then the influences of those things. So one final thing I wanted to do before we, we move on to questions is explore this idea of, of predispositions, because it seems to represent a lot of those recurring themes we see in descriptions of what social capital is. You know, it's these permitting and facilitating cooperation attitudes, psychological states, and so forth. So to me, all of these represent a, a predisposition towards others that embodies a potential or an ability or a capacity. That's that capital nature of what social capital is all about. So this, this idea then of predispositions, it, it can involve self-interest, it can involve normative influence, cognitive biases and habits, instinct, uh, the influence of coordinating institutions, morality, religion, all of these things can be encaptured in the idea of, of predispositions, and it also allows for intentionality sense so it doesn't ignore the important role of human agency in determining behaviour. Um, the reason why I chose predispositions rather than dispositions is that the pre signals a state before or in advance of a situation, and therefore it doesn't predetermine action. It allows for calculation, intention, agency, and context to all arise in this potential or ability that is manifested in this form of what social capital is all about. And a focus on predisposition reflects that potential nature of social capital, given that a set of predispositions does not necessarily result in any particular outcome. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be nothing depending on the context. But it is that ability, it is that ability to, to do something. You know, if I have a $100 note in my hand, it has the ability to do things, has that potential. But then again, I might lose it or burn it and it does nothing at all. So capital really is, I think, is that potential nature and this idea, up to me at least, of, of predispos predispositions in, in capula encapsulates that, that form or core of social capital that goes beyond lists and examples. So this question, I would, for me at least, the answer is yes. But there's more questions I think we need to ask of this approach. And one of them is whether or not it's actually a useful and suitable construct for theory building and empirical inquiry. And that one I'm far less sure certain about. And also whether or not it could be universally understood and accepted and applied. You know, I think if you if you come from sociology, you, you really understand and you've studied um, Habitus and Bourdieu's understanding, then this probably makes an awful lot of sense to you. Uh, similarly, if you've studied structure and agency in, in sociology or in philosophy, uh, system and life world from Habermas, this probably makes a lot of sense to you, but can it be universally understood and, and imply, um, applied and accepted in the current episteme that, that we live in? And I'm, I'm far less certain of that. So I tentatively put forward this, this idea of predispositions and the way it might fit into understandings of social capital um, with these, these caveats, with this uncertainty about how effective it actually is. So in terms of a summary, uh, social capital is corrective to asocial understandings of the world, seems to be a very common theme that we see from the very early days of social capital. 
but often these foundations are, are quite unclear and uncertain and the solutions often res, uh, default back to reductionism and, and methodological individualism that ultimately undermines the, the corrective potential of the concept that it, it can produce some new knowledge, some actually some really interesting and great new knowledge, but it could be a little more if we were to build a bit more of a, a balanced um, theoretical foundation. Um, approaches tend to focus on some combination of connectedness, resources and sociability one or more of those things perhaps and i'm not certainly not suggesting that any every uh, research approach to social capital needs to incorporate all three different contexts require different kinds of approaches and i think the typology that i presented has a, a lot of potential benefits in in understanding the theory the the propositions that are actually involved uh, the dis differences and similarities between approaches it may help us to separate source form and outcomes, uh, the relationship between measurement proxies, and also what's missing from these kinds of approaches as well. Um, and I think it's, it's not complete. I think it needs a bit more input, a few more ideas. As we saw, uh, the sources are still really just a list. We need to probably put some thought into how they could be uh, refined a little bit more. So finally, just a few things for us to consider as we move forward with our social capital work and research and, and, and use of the concept. I think it's useful to, un, to examine what the propositions are of our approach. Now, what is the theory that we're actually presenting? What is the causal relationship uh, between these different components? And also, what is the nature of human experience and action that's embedded in our approach to social capital? Like, are we quite comfortable having imported whatever our discipline specific understanding is, or have we adopted the uh, rational choice theory? Or, you know, what is it actually that we're, we're basing our work on? And what assumptions are involved in our approach as well? I think that, that some approaches involve assumptions and it's necessary to make assumptions in, in uh, scholarly work, but what are they and can we really justify them? And another question is, is our methodological approach well suited to investigate our particular research question and context? And I think quite often we just default to what we know and what we're familiar with without thinking about necessarily whether it's the best way to get an understanding of what we're looking at. And ultimately, is our approach helping to solve the problem we hope that it would address in the first place? Uh, and I think that's a really important question. Lots of references. I realize you probably can't read them all on this slide, um, but feel free to get in touch with me if you want some further details about any of that. And that's it, time for questions. Hi, Tristan. Where We've been, we having, we're having, been having a very busy time in the background here. <laughs> Lots of discussion. And we have three questions. We have, uh, oh, let me see. Um, Andy, I just saw had a question from, uh, and we've been chatting in, in the chat as well. Um, what, does you, what do you see as the difference between the bridging, bonding, and linking social capital? Uh, can I just pick up one point there? I mean, I've been, like many in the room, witnessed hundreds of webinars, but today we've been blessed with a true masterclass. So brilliant job there, Tristan. <laughs> well done, mate. And uh, and I was surprised that um, uh, in the analysis, I come from uh, th this as a practitioner running a social enterprise in the field, that um, uh, the idea of social identities wasn't more to the fore in terms of uh, definitions and labels. You might say, well, it's a, perhaps a subset of social norms, but uh, and it just seems to me that one sort of observation is that you've done a brilliant analysis within the paradigm of social capital. But if we adopt a bigger perspective, our world faces massive challenges. I hope everyone in the room seen the film Don't Look Up. But I regard sort of social capital and the changing levels of in social capital as perhaps the critical issue, because if we don't address that, we can't then solve problems like climate crisis and so on. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether uh, actually there's a massive opportunity because it's got to be recognised that our society's got to do something. Otherwise, like in the film, don't look up. Sorry to ruin it. We may end, uh, come to a bad ending. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether actually we've got a great opportunity to transform, regalvanize, rejuvenize uh, an interest in social capital through these wider societal challenges, which um, there's been a massive increase in behavioral 
uh, uh, sciences and so on. And I just think that this, we've got a great opportunity here. But is there a need for more emphasis on social uh, sort of shared identities about the bonding uh, uh, capital side of things? So it's a bit long-winded. I think absolutely the answer is yes. Um, in an earlier iteration of that typology, I had social identity. And I originally placed it sitting between the source and the form of social capital because social identity clearly has a really powerful role in shaping our understanding of the world, our, the way in which we relate to other people and the nature of our predispositions. Sorry, I'm defaulting to my way of thinking about social capital, which is, is, is predispositions. But I think social identity is very powerful as a source but it also is very powerful as the form as well, and perhaps also plays a very important role in the context which manifests the outcomes. So I think you've just hit an, right on the head a really important point, which is that the typology I've presented isn't everything. And there are some really important points, particularly coming out of areas such as social psychology that aren't very well represented in that typology yet, but I'd like to see them in the future. Thank you. Um, Andy also indicated some interesting research that they've actually done that you might like to just um, talk about the Cognitive Conversations months quickly. So, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. So we just recently completed a program in London. Uh, Lon uh, the native London is called a Cockney, uh, but there's some uh, questions about its identity and future. And an interesting insight really emerged from it was about this issue of confidence. And as confidence is a word that is, I believe is I've come from a communications industry background, and I'm actually of the belief now that confidence is the critical uh, dimension that holds our, our society together. And I'm just wondering whether the uh, concept of confidence that um, we're in a business of maintaining confidence that I won't kill you, hurt you, support you, and so on, and um, and also how I send out my messages and connect with other people. So I'm just wondering whether, again, there's a potential asset there in uh, our work as being key agents for managing societal confidence. Um, Andy, I think, again, you've identified something that isn't typically listed um, as being one of the core components of what social capital is all about, but it clearly shapes the nature of our action in really powerful ways. And it probably, again, is one of those things that may eventually come out of uh, psychology and social psychology, uh, which contributes significantly to the theory development uh, and our understanding of the way social capital works and the, the processes involved. Um, so I think it, it fits very nicely with my predispositions uh, sort of concept, but it doesn't necessarily fit neatly into you know, norms and social trust and, and networks kind of approach. Um, there's lots of discussions in about negative feedback too. So I've actually sort of said maybe it'd be a good idea to go and revisit the cheap social capital by Lyndon, Lyndon um, uh, Robertson. So yeah, anyway, suggestions there. Andy, is there anything else before we move on? You can look Please up. let everyone else have, 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 I'm very thank, <laughs> grateful for your response. Thank you. <laughs> We've actually got Chisholm uh, has been with us all uh, throughout the webinar, Tristan, and Chisholm asked an earlier question um, about where does Hannafan sit in, but Chisholm, did you want to ask Tristan the question? And yeah, actually, because I'm actually I'm kind of carrying out a research on social capital in Africa, actually, because I'm also using the 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 components of um, World Bank. So I stumbled on this writing of uh, Hanifan and I realized that um, he was actually the first person that made, made mention of um, the concept of social capital. And like Tristan mentioned at the beginning, um, he, him too, Hanifan says that, that he used, he used um, the capital in the social capital as, as metaphor, as metaphorical, not just like in connection with um, money or, I mean, cash or anything like that, but in terms of resources. And I discovered that in the community where I was carrying out, I carried out um, research, I carried out um, interviews and group discussions. And it was so amazing how one of the women in the community said, 
we are very happy about what the grandmother project is doing in a community because they have made us to realize our resources i was i had goosebumps all over my body and i asked her what do you mean by resources she said resources is not about money these are uneducated women say so resources are not about money it's about the goodwill people have it's about the the connectedness that they have it's, it's about the willingness to help each other to the extent that they could actually bring contribute money to take the, um, any sick person to the hospital. If the person doesn't have money, they kind of come together to contribute money to buy books for, for their children, for, for families that cannot afford that. So I was actually feeling that um, now I'm actually in the process of my analysis and I realized that this concept goes very well with um, what I saw in Senegal, it goes very well with Hanifan's um, original and definition of um, social capital without actually so much emphasis on the economic aspect, economic like the money aspect of it or the economic benefit they get. But I also discovered that this connectedness, the, the social action actually led them to come together to be able to do something for, for the community. And, and there's this kind of commitment from each one of them. So I was actually wondering where to situate this because like fine, I wanted to use Putnam as my uh, my background um, um, definition, but now with this Hanifan, I realized that I it it has all the elements that I saw on the ground. So I'm just wondering where you would put the definition of Hanifan in connection with the other uh, proponents. Well, I think Hanifan's definition is very consistent with. Uh, modern understandings of, of what social capital is all about. So for those who don't know, Hanifan was a, a superintendent of um, school board in, and wrote in 1916 and 1920 about social capital and really described social capital in, in much the same way we've been talking about it um, in, this, in this webinar. And I think that it, it's a, I agree with what you're saying. I think that it, it isn't a very economic way of thinking about it. It's, it is quite a balanced and, and useful way of, of thinking about social capital. Uh, and I think also that what I tend to find when I'm talking to people about social capital is that as soon as they understand the importance of it, they immediately start changing their behavior and their actions. Uh, and so this is, in some ways, this is a bit of a challenge because if you're trying to research social capital and you ask people about the importance of it, then they immediately start changing their actions and you, you've changed basically the, the social capital exists in a particular context. But that's great from an intervention point of view because it means that all we need to do to improve social capital is basically talk about it. Uh, and my general theory or understanding of the reasons why is because in modern societies, uh, we're so, um, we undervalue the importance of social relationships and, and what we can get from acting together collectively, collaboratively from sharing and helping. And as soon as we start becoming more consciously aware of the, the importance and values of these things, then it immediately influences our actions um, and improves social capital. Thank so I'm, you. I'm not sure if that answers your question exactly. I think that if you were to take the typology, you could pull out the aspects that Hannah Fan talked about and you might place them on the typology and see see how it fits with some of the other understandings that I talked about. Okay, thank you so much. I also have another question to ask, but I also want to go for another meeting in the next one minute. So I, I don't know if I could join in the um, later session also. Yes, absolutely, you're welcome to. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Matthias. Do you have a question or comment? I think you are just on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, congratulations, Tristan, for your presentation. I think it was really, really interesting, really intellectual and constructive also. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, you spoke well, you, you give us a very global and holistic uh, view, uh, really important. 
Um, one of the topics um, you spoke about uh, was about the components of social capital. Um, you spoke about the, um, the the social the social norms, the social norms, and also you spoke about the uh, goodwill and the predispositions of people. But I think that uh, well, and other aspects like social networks and, and other other issues. But I think that you didn't quote it the the um, the concept of value. So as as you know, um, in in many research uh, uh, researches. They speak about um, social norms, but also about values, and we know that they are both a related concept. But I think that is a powerful uh, word, values, because it gives us the the content of social capital. It is, it is uh, as we know, a thick conception and really important in order to know the nature of the, as you said, the prey or what what is. Um, the, the first thing that uh, made up the, the predispositions of people. So in this sense, um, I would like to, to ask you about this point, the, the, the word of values, the concept of values that uh, is maybe a powerful aspect of the cognitive dimension of social capital. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've made a good point. And I think it's, it's, another, it's, an, it's another example of something else that belongs in that list. And the fact that it, it is a list means there could be a lot of other things that we could add to it. Uh, you know, and values, I, I didn't make mention to, to values, but, but values and attitudes and beliefs and, and really like moral beliefs as well, um, you know, moral standards, like there's a lot of things potentially that can be included in, in that list, you know, in that sort of core aspect of, of what social capital is. Um, things like empowerment that came out of the World Bank's dimensions that I didn't originally have in there because I was really just building it from the majority of the literature. And also Andy's point about, you know, there's other things as well that, that fits and, and belongs in there as well. And I think this is one of the challenges of not particularly having a core theme, you know, a real understanding of, of what social capital is and relying on lists of different things is that it, it becomes very complex. You know, how do we incorporate norms and social trust and values and beliefs and morality and empowerment and confidence and, you know, like the list kind of goes on and on and on. Um, but I think there are perhaps some core themes that sit behind those things that could help us to design our research projects a little better than we currently are. Um, so I don't know if that particularly answers your question. I'm acknowledging that values absolutely are important and they, they do uh, belong and have a position within social capital. Yes, yes, uh, sure. Um, and, and it is um, clear that it may be it's a delicate topic, um, maybe difficult to um, to specify. But um, and in the sense, it is good what what you said about predispositions, goodwill, because maybe are um, clearer than than values. That is a bit more abstract. But um, as you say, is is a core co component uh, too. But uh, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, Matthias. I think like I'm really keen to hear from people from different schools of thought about how the typology works, like what is particularly missing from it, how it could be reshaped to improve our understanding. So, you know, um, I'm interested in hearing from economists and from psychologists and anthropologists and sociologists. You know, like I think there's a, a lot of people perhaps can have input to this to improve this tool that can help us perhaps to organize our thoughts and understandings of, of all of these different approaches. I think Mario comes next, Tristan. Uh, Mario registered a question before, um, uh, earlier, and he's telling us, so he's actually at the moment mapping um, personal and institutional relationships using something called Kumu. <laughs> and it's showing the power relationships. So Mario might um, like to tell us a little bit about that and or ask his question. Coming from South Africa. Uh, hello. Um... <clears throat> 
Sorry, I, should... I just need to get my mic my microphone <laughs> sorted out so that you can actually hear me. Yeah, um, we can. So my, my work's been very practical in, in the domain of development of rural areas and uh, sort of IT-based development in terms of getting broadband access to rural areas in South Africa. And uh, one of the approaches we had was uh, you need local to build local capabilities to support technology. So we've got lots of projects in Africa where um, local uh, youngsters are actually trained up to be technical support of your Wi-Fi infrastructure and also to help users to, use, to get benefits from the access to internet. So there the importance of infomediaries, intermediaries also become important. And their social capital is really important because they are building the networks um, between between the technology use as such, as an entity maybe, we can look at things like that, and then the integrating it with the, the businesses of people and the social lives of people. So I think that's another angle on social capital. So my study was using NetMap, which um, was born out of consultation in uh, River Delta about uh, water resources in Africa. And uh, that was very implicit in terms of making it a pictorial, you know. Uh, you have a flip chart and uh, you put down things and then you assign power to diff or influence to different actors in the system. And you can do that manually using macaronis or in my case, I was talking and using <laughs> a flip chart, which is with yellow stickets. But I found it wonderful to use the framework of social capital, social resources, because we could work on six levels. And on the same, we created an artifact, a chart together. And um, the building of it, the process of actually building uh, entrepreneurs um, or info, info media or intermediaries um, existing networks and what they've done to actually get to a sustainable business for themselves was, um, I think that was my contribution uh, to sort of the research uh, done in social capital and ICT for development world. So uh, it is, my PhD is said to be the most <laughs> uh, exhaustive content on social capital in action <laughs> in ICT for development. But that because it was such a narrow focus, but yeah, I've got 14 stories. I had 14 stories to tell and the social capital and um, Dorothea Kleiner's uh, network, which is um, based on the capability approach, was also very useful. So there's a whole background uh, of using Dorothea Kleiner's choice framework as well. She's at the University of uh, Sheffield, Professor at the University of Sheffield. But anyway, that's a short story, uh, but I'm continuing to do it because the relationship structures in, uh, especially in South Africa is, um, very, very important as an African country as well. And so, yeah, one cannot um, ignore the disruption of uh, existing relationship structures as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I, I breezed over so much in my presentation. I mean, it was a long presentation, but there's still so much to dig into with, with so many things. You know, I mentioned the network approach, uh, the resource approach, but I didn't really provide much in the way of explanation mm. of the, how that can happen and how we might de mm. use it to really um, uncover and dig into mm. particular research mm. context. And I think what you've described mm. is a really good example of how we can use those kinds of approaches to really understand mm. how people mm. are connected and how, mm. uh, how perhaps mm. we can uh, intervene in those, those mm. connections as mm. well. Mm. Yeah. One thing that came out was also the very important role of the church uh, a particular um, in two churches were actively involved with having special um, sessions where entrepreneurs uh, that that is from the community would actually then give lectures to in the church to young people who want to be entrepreneurs. So your cultural institutions and in many of these rural communities, the church is a very powerful um, cultural institution, and uh, they're also a very powerful market for the entrepreneurs to sell to. So <laughs> both roles were uh, quite prominent. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's perhaps an area that's a little bit um, under-researched is the role of um, mm. religious organisations. I mean, it has been mm. from a structural point of view, but the sorts of things mm. that you're describing, I think, um, mm. perhaps are a little under-researched in, in <laughs> ways in which it contributes really significantly. Mm. Mm. So in, in just in closing, I really appreciate your efforts, Tristan, and I uh, would love to uh, collaborate and uh, add what I can because um, I, I've, since my exposure, I'm seeing the world through a relationship lens all the time, you know, so which is great fun. <laughs> As do I, haunted by it, 20 years of, of thinking about <laughs> social capital. <laughs> That's all I yeah. see when I look at everything, think about everything. Mm -hmm. I think we have two new presenters. We've got Mario. I, I think people would love to hear what he's been doing, etc. And Andy, Andy seems to be doing some interesting stuff. I'm dobbing you in here, Andy, to do a presentation for us. Yeah, no, I'd love to. You, yeah. We'd love to. Yeah. Sam, did you have a question or comment? Oh, hey, Tristan. Um, great presentation. Um, I was just wondering, do you think with social capital theory that like you're chasing a moving target over time and with regards to like technological evolution and like how we evolve over time as a species? And do you think there will ever be a like theory of everything equation for like social capital, like something like EMC squared or something like that? Um, I can answer the second one first because no. <laughs> um, we definitely can't break down the social world to something that's quite so simple. Uh, you know, enormous complexity. So I would, I'd hope no one would ever try because I don't think it'd have a whole lot of meaning. But I think the first one is, the first question I think is really interesting because different people have theorized that we're losing social capital or that um, technology is, is destroying social capital or perhaps it's really building and enhancing social capital in different ways in which we, we're using it. So it is something that I think is changing quite significantly. Um, but the core principles and the core ideas behind social capital are still going to have relevance, regardless of what sort of technological solutions may exist that may change or influence the way in which humans ultimately interact and, and behave with each other. Um, but I think it, you know, it is a really interesting question, and it's something that is actually being quite extensively researched. It's the, the, the ICT kind of um, field of social capital research is, I think it's in the top six or eight um, different fields. So it's it's something that's actively being researched and there's a lot of interest in it as well, for sure. And it's a fascinating question, <laughs> you know, whether we're losing social capital or not because of the sorts of technological changes that we're seeing. So Marion, do we have any, any other questions? Uh, no, we don't at this stage. I'm chatting away in the background. Um... No, no burning questions at this stage, though. Well, I think if you're anything like me, you probably need to just look at the typology and think for about a week. Um, when I first came up with it, that's basically what I, how I spent a few weeks of my time was just looking and thinking and fitting pieces in and considering how it all, how it all fits and, and builds together. So I think for me, at least, it, it, it provides a lot of opportunity for, for exploring the different approaches. Um, and hopefully it does for you as well, or perhaps you, you, it makes sense to you to present it in a slightly different way. But if, and if it does, I'd be very interested in what those differences are so that we can hopefully uh, include that as well and reach more people uh, with this typology. All right, we run out of questions. We have. Right on time as well. So, so let's end it there. Um, as you know, I'll be doing this again in 12 hours time for the people who are currently asleep. Uh, so if you're so inclined, you're, you're welcome to join, but I certainly don't expect you to. I'm just going to be saying the same thing really all over again. Um, next week, we don't have a webinar. There's Easter in a lot of places around the world. Um, so we're not going to have a webinar next week. The following week, we have a very interesting webinar by um, Brian Gearing, who has written some very interesting articles about um, basically critiquing social capital from certain perspectives. Um, so his, his webinar is going to be in two weeks' time. And I think after that, we have Alexander Dill the following week. So you can check out all of those events on, on the website under events. 
Well, thanks everyone. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Tristan. Thanks, Tristan. We'll see you in the morning.